presentation, this for, I'm going to be uh, talking twice today, once on the court and now here in the, in the classroom. Uh, I've made this presentation a couple of times. Uh, what we're going to be doing is uh, looking at some pro footage and seeing what we can learn from it. Um, you can see the topic, how to analyze pro footage for help your students. And this is kind of like the three things I hope we can accomplish. Uh, the goal is, can we be better teachers? Um, the second thing is, and you should know this, students. First of all, let me ask you this. How many of you have looked at pro footage online somewhere? YouTube, my site, someone else's site. So almost all the hands go up. Um, I asked a group of 36 high school players that same question a couple weeks ago when I knew I'd be making this topic. And out of 36 people, here's what I said to the 36 people. Players, how many of you guys have ever been online and watched pros hitting shots, pro footage of tennis strokes? And what percentage of their hands do you think went up? Take a guess. Five. I hear zero and I hear 100. So Five percent. Uh, it was like 80 percent. Which completely blew me away because I thought maybe the adults would be more into it and I knew tennis pros would be into it. But students are into it. Uh, which I thought was, then I thought, first was, whoa, that was a surprise. Two was, well, great, they're into it. And then three was, ugh, what, they're watching this themselves. There's no one there pointing things out. And I've learned, I, do, I don't do a lot of private stuff, but I've learned a couple times where people say, well, I saw this, that I saw this, or where'd you see it? It's going online. So our students are watching. Um, and then the, the last thing I hope to do is to show you where to, where to find this kind of footage. Um, here's who we're going to be looking at. Uh, Federer, Djokovic, Williams, Andy Murray, Simona Howell, Rinka, Dimitrov, and Dave Dvorak. I just got some <laughs> footage of him down there. So, those are the players. So a lot of times, uh, let me just kind of say this. When it comes to technique, tennis pros are very opinionated, it turns out. Generally, I speak on the court, and it's not about technique. And when I do speak about technique, there's always in a room this big, at least 10 of you. You don't know who you are. You do know who you are, but you won't admit it. You're like, these dudes don't know anything, man. I'll tell them why. And they really think that's the cast me out. They're all about technique. And I found that in my travels around the world that if you make, on a scale of 10, the 10 being a pro that's just all about technique, I mean, that's where they spend most of their time that's the singular most important thing in their life. If I gotta get my, per my people perfect or close to perfect technique, that there'd be a 10. And then you have other pros way over here, on the, they're a one, and on that technique scale, they're like, eh, whatever. It's more important that they have fun, get them playing, you know, whatever. I mean, technique's important, but they're, they're really not technical coaches, right? And then all of us are gonna fall on that scale someplace along the line. So if you're a nine, you probably don't think the guy who's a two does it right. And if you're a two, you're like, look at that chump. He's trying to tech tweak the hell out of that forehand for the third, 300th lesson. And that's not the kid's problem. The kid doesn't know how to think. You know, that's, so that's kind of where we are. So um, technique wise, uh, here's my, and I think I'm more, to be honest, I'm probably a five or a four on that scale. Uh, I, I want my kids to have good technique, but Personally, the way my career unfolded was uh, I got a hold of some really good kids early. When I was young, frankly, the easier thing for me to teach was technique because I didn't know how to deliver uh, good strategy, good mental toughness, and good fitness. So I thought, well, I know more technique than these kids. So I was kind of a technical coach early on. And the result was I had some pretty sweet looking kids that looked quite well. I mean, they looked good technique wise. But then after, right about my eighth or ninth year of full-time teaching, I started having doubts, second doubts, like what, what's going on? My kids look amazing. They freaking can't win. Why can't my kids win? Why can't they take these beautiful strokes and actually convert it into Ws? Uh, and then that kind of was my own personal involvement. So uh, when it comes to technique on the serve, I like to use nine checkpoints. I'll show them to you here in a minute. Uh, and the reason we're, to, we're just going to go through these real quickly uh, because they're going to matter when we look at the footage. And then I personally like to use six checkpoints um, on the ground strokes, which I'll show you them. And then also range of acceptability. This is kind of a concept I want to really have you think about. 
range of acceptability is this. Um, if Let's just say we're having a debate and, and someone says, the best forehand drip on the Pro Tour or for high level is Eastern. That's my statement and I'm standing by it. And then another pro says, semi-Western dude. Come on, everybody's semi-Western. Wake up. And here comes another guy, dude. Jim Currier, number one in the world, <laughs> all the way under, full Western. I mean, everybody's full. So we would all have opinions about that, right? Um, who thinks the most common grip is Eastern? Uh, were the really best players? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, say again. On the like best players on the yeah, tour. Yeah, best right? high performance college and tour. No one's voting for Eastern. Okay, good, good it's not. Uh, Semi Western. Who thinks that that's the most common? Right, most of you. Who thinks the full Western is the most common? So we're 100 percent agreement. It's, is semi-Western. So my point is, can you find a player on the tour with an Eastern? Yeah. So what do you, would you say that that's in the range of acceptability? Like, yes, maybe not my prefer, but it's within the range. What I think and what scares me a bit about coaches, and I had to figure this out for myself, is uh, we'll take technique and we'll just stay there forever. <coughs> and literally for years and years and years we're just tweaking and tweaking and tweaking and perfecting and it's all about technique and I'm here to say if you look at 10 you're gonna see um, you're gonna see pros that look uh, mostly the same on most shots but there's some differences that's the range of acceptability each of us as your own personal teaching style has to decide what's your range of acceptability I'm here to propose that it's not just as rigid as we think okay um, one of the things I figured out was I would always say on the volley, you know, I like to use swing size, so the segmented swing, this is five, four, three, two, you go to zero is where you hit, and then one, two, three, four, five. Same thing for a ground stroke, this is five, four, three, two, one, I hit at the point, at the point of contact, one, two, three, four, five. So this is a five, five, this is a three, five, this is a one, one. And what I've learned is what I'm telling people on their volley, my players, is actually not correct. It's not what really happens. So we're going to look at that. So um, real quick, we'll start out with the, the nine checkpoints, and I'll show you these first three. Um, by the way, this this is actually a document that I have because we have at our club a serve class. It's, not, it's called the serve return class. You might want to consider this. And if people come there, they serve and return for an hour, first two shots. And um, I will take a video of them. I have footage, so I have and then I paste this into a document. This is a legal size document you're seeing in the top third. And this is Novak for reference. This is my player. This is what I want them to be <coughs> checking. And this is a pass or a fail. Uh, by the way, I'm happy to send you that document if you want to rip it off. Uh, I'll put a card up here. You can just email me at info at tennis drills. But that class is blown up. We're making probably 15,000 bucks a year of people taking that class. And it's helping them with the first two shots. So um, you may or may not agree with my checkpoints, so that's why it's a word document, you can change it. Um, so I think it's the rituals, I want to make sure they're doing the ritual. I have her serving sideways because I wanted a, a black carb, I know that's not a tennis court there. Um, we talk about weight transfer, what should be happening, we talk about the ball release, and then that last column I'm grading each player. Here's the next four, loading. Um, you guys know, I'm sure, obviously he's from here, uh, Mark Kovacs, right? He's got nine, and he, I think he calls them slightly different things. Um, pretty much the same. Um, he had, one of them was called cocking, and I could just see me handing out a page with the word cocking, and I, <laughs> <laughs> so I changed it to voting or whatever, but uh, I do have to deal with the kids. So um, here's what I'm looking for, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because I want you to see the footage. And then these are the last three things I look for. And those are the uh, checkpoints on the serve. Now, on the ground strokes, these are mine. Some people like these. Some people think I'm wrong. Uh, the first one for me is that unit turn. Then I call it loading, where the weight loads on that back foot, and they're starting to push off. It's a little bit bent there, you can see. And uh, number three here, you see what I call the explode, where they start transferring everything forward. Number four is the point of contact. Number five is extension. And number six is the finish. It could be various finishes. I've heard good pros say, you gotta finish here. Another pro, 
no, it's got to be here. No, it's got to be here. And they literally argue <coughs> about, are you crazy? It's here. How can you not think it's here? Dude, it's got to be here. Well, if you watch 10 pros hit 10 forehands, they finish all over the place. It's, how you, it's what you want to do with the ball. It's how you're trying to make the ball behave. So if I'm playing you and you're at the net and I'm trying to deliver a little dipper, I might go pocket to pocket because that's the shot I need for that shot. But if you're at the net and I'm going backwards and you're really close and tight, I might go pocket to here do because I try to hit a what just now? A top spin lob. And if I'm moving inside the court and I'm going to drive it because you're not in position, I might go maybe shoulder or ribs the shoulder because it's more of a drive. So the finishes, don't get caught up on the finishes. You really need them all. I'm going to show you both. I think I have Fed here and Novak doing Rafa's thing. I think they got a release from Rafa that they can do that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's uh, let's start looking at stuff. So what we're going to do is these videos have a little music. I'm not playing the music, I hope. There I am. Don't fall asleep. <laughs> All right, so here's what you're looking at. This is uh, my friend Rick. He's my next door neighbor. Now this is Federer. <laughs> and uh, this footage, I got it because I had the ability to get a media pass a couple years ago at the Cincinnati Masters. <laughs> and um, <laughs> oh, this came up. <laughs> I haven't spoken before, I don't know how to do these. <laughs> Carmen's almost ready to help me. I can do it, Carmen. Okay, so there we go. Uh, get in there. Um, funny story, when I first started seeing this kind of footage and seeing it so clearly, and, and, and two, this is 240 frames a second, I started like, whoa, this is like really cool stuff. Uh, and then I was invited to speak and um, Australia, and I had a, <coughs> I just bought a little $300 camera, not a phone camera, and I, I took it to Australia to take some pictures, and I, I, I'm playing it, and I go, wow, it says I can shoot video here at 240 frames a second. I can even do it at 560 and 960 frames per second. So I spent the whole week in Australia thinking, I'm capturing all this unbelievable footage, screw 240 frames, I'm doing 560 frames, and I got like probably 100 clips of pros, came back home, give it to my editor, I go, dude, we're gonna put this up, it's gonna be awesome. And it looked like I shot it in a closet. <laughs> and it turns out that a $300 camera doesn't do that. You can do 960 frames, but it won't keep it high def. If you want to do 240 frames and high def, you gotta get a camera that actually does that. Well, what does that cost? 12,000 bucks, <laughs> bummer. So um, I I rented it. Okay. So uh, this is this is where we get that footage. So what you're looking at is 1080. That's full high definition and 200 frames or 240 frames per second. So remember those nine checkpoints. Uh, one was rituals that you did. Here's the the weight transfer. The one thing I can tell you about uh, Federer. One of my big beasts is when they do take the first one rituals and then number two is the weight transfer. Most pros have this clearly defined. Weights back, you can see their butt muscle, not literally, um, but their racket's in front, okay? It's this real distinct, boom. Fed is the only one I found that kind of, his racket's pretty far back already. Uh, it's back by his back leg. So let's just watch it one time through. Okay, so can you see a few things there that maybe you wouldn't see full speed for sure, right? Mm -hmm. So if I play this again, here's my takeaway. Watch Fed here. Weight's on the front foot, his back foot's unweighted. It's going back, but the racket's already there. Look at a little, oh crud, I did that last few time. <laughs> uh, let's jump out to here. His front foot's unweighted. <laughs> palm down. For sure, one of the bigger problems we have to fix with rec players is palm up here, weight or tray. You won't find a pro that's not palm down. I mean, it's super and super important. Notice like a 90 degree angle here. 
I like, what I like about Federal Reserve is he does this thing, I call it the salute. And the salute has helped me help my players. You know what a salute is, right? Salute. Uh, he gets in this position here. And so, and so the salute is a great way to start people that have that waiter tray. Because if anything, it should be up. And they're here. So if you say, don't do this, go here, they, they still go here. So really, go one step further, go here. Have them start here, comb their hair, and toss it up. And that's helping a whole bunch with that particular issue. You can see he's covering up the line, basic trophy position here. <coughs> I'm going to back up. Super important here, if you're filming someone from the side, you see how we can see the W? That means he's going up on edge. Major, major thing. And we're seeing that side of the racket. And then we don't see anything but the edge. But here's the key. On the next couple of frames, we see the other side. So when I film, this is if you're, I'm hitting a serve at you, it should come up on edge, hit, other side. And a lot of what happens is it comes up on edge, maybe, hit, this. There's not that. The way I fix that is to talk about inverting the elbow. It's not so much what happens in this part of the arm, it's what happens back in here. And if you can get them in that picture of the inverted elbow, it's pretty helpful. The way, I hope you don't think that what I'm going to do here is, is tell you all technique. I just want to show, we're going to learn together. Uh, I want to get through a couple. Uh, here's a front view because the front view of him and the, and the salute is really helpful. Releases, oh, I do that again. He releases at about eye high. The very second the ball leaves the hands, he's about eye high, right? And it's about a 45 degree usually. These are all parameters, checkpoints. So let me tell you what I mean. I'm at the baseline, I'm serving that way. My arm, almost always with these better players, is releasing about eye high. They're not flicking it here, they're not holding it too far. And it's usually their arm is at a 45 towards that post. Now, can you find a pro that will hook it back here? Yes, most pros are here. What I teach my player the J toss, I probably wouldn't. Okay, I try to get him here. If I get a player who's got a J toss and it's pretty good, what I insist on, I gotta fix that, I probably wouldn't. To me, it's in the range of acceptability, even though it might not be my preferred thing. So watch him get to the salute. <coughs> Boom. Crap. <laughs> I hear a lot of crafts out of me. All right, we don't need that anymore. Um, so, backhand volley, this is something that on this video I actually discovered for myself. You guys know Brian Marcus probably, right? He used to be at this club. Brian and I taught together with Dave up in um, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And Brian was a good player and particularly a pretty good volleyer. And uh, a true story, I was a decent player, probably the highest I ever, ever was in my life was 5'5". Five, five. So this close to going pro, not really at all. <laughs> um, and Brian, when I was like in my prime, like late 20s, Brian was like in his early 40s, and he could beat all of us guys, he could beat. And I remember playing him a set down below at East Hills, and uh, he beat me like 6-3 in the set, we're sitting down. And I started and volleyed and chipped and charged because I had no baseline game. And we were sitting down, if you know Brian, you'll appreciate this, he goes, so he's sitting there and he, you know, he always pointed, you know, your volley, Dave's gonna die. I go, yeah, what, what about it? It's not good. <laughs> like, well, what? It's not good, because that's all I do is volley. He goes, you just, you, you know, you don't know, get it. Uh, and I said, so what? Uh, he says, here, every time you volley, you're trying to add power to the shot. You're like a caveman up there. Every volley, you're trying to stick it and put it away, which I do, literally, I was taught to stick the volley. That was my coach's key words. Uh, he says, what well, you need, so you're good up here, but you're kind of 
crappy down below the net. If I get it low, I can just stop to point because I know you're not going to make it. And I go low. <laughs> so here's what you got to do. Try to hit 10% just on every volley. Just feel like you're hitting 10% more underspin. Just try it. Um, and it was one of my aha moments. I had an aha moment that day. And we sparred for a little bit, and I said, let's just keep doing this. And I, every little volley was going in, it was going deep. And I, that day, at that moment, it's one of those times in your career where you're like, my volley just improved 40% in five minutes through understanding, not through grinding. He also told me something, <laughs> bring your racket towards your ear on the backhand volley, towards your ear. I always thought that was a weird one. And then I saw this video and I'm like, whoa. So what we're gonna look at here is Federer hitting three volleys in a row. I'll just let it play through the first time. There's one. Ask yourself if he's going towards his ear. This one he's gonna snap off a little bit more, I think. Okay, so let's, let's look at that a little bit closer. Here's the first one. So all the classic things, right? Racket cradle, ball goes up. It doesn't go back this way so much. It kind of goes, I think, more towards his ear, okay? Um, watch it again. The more, he, the more power Fed hits on the backhand volley, the more he cocks it behind his head. So let's just watch something. This is not quite a side view or a front view, it's a 45 view, right? And check this out. And then one more. <laughs> so cocky on that one. Good. So would you say if you were facing him from straight on that that racket would be behind his head? Yeah. yeah. Would you have said that's the case if you hadn't seen this? I don't think I would have. I would have said, well, Fed, yeah, he's probably, you know. But he's here. So I'm volunteering to you, and this is Fed. It's really up and not so much back. Um, and of course, he leaves with the, the bottom edge and stuff. So. I show this to some of my players who have like that big fat backswing and trying to get them so their backhand volley is this, you know, you're trying to get them to come up here if we get that to go here. And it helps for some. But I, that was one of the videos I saw and I, I had a, an aha moment. Okay, Murray, <coughs> what I like about Murray's forehand is how rotational it is. I want you to pay attention, we'll watch it here. You see a full front, like if he was literally <laughs> I'll say it all together next time I do that. Okay. Um, so he's literally facing us full on, except his head's looking to the left, right? So we see full frontal exposure. So. <laughs> now, watch how much rotation. We're going to see full frontal not exposure see that? So he showed you this. Do you think your players are showing you that? Because he kind of is, right? There's a ton of rotation. Now he doesn't have nearly as much rotation on his forehand. So when I have players who don't really use the kinetic link and they're kind of armors, but they kind of half arm it, I can show them this video uh, and they'll at least have a visual. And then if I have this, <laughs> and I can show them and then I can coach as I am and then compare them. Uh, it's been super helpful. All right, so watch it again. Here's that, and we'll jump to here, that. That's pretty big. Here's his view, okay? So this literally came to me on the website. <clears throat> I had put out a drill about the technique on serve or something, <coughs> and I said something in this video about how the roll of the left hand is tucked inward and towards, and I looked at, everybody does that differently. Usually it's like this, this part right here touches a rib, or it tucks in really close to it, All right? And someone said, Murray doesn't do that, so you're wrong. So, <laughs> but I'm gonna show you 
what I sent back to this person. Because Murray is deceiving. Let me just do this. This is what that guy refers to. Murray ends up with a little arm flung way out there. Okay, so from right here, you see that? So that's a little unusual. Most pros don't end with their arm way back like that. But let's watch from the beginning, and we'll stop it right when I'm right and the other guy's wrong. Because that's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing I was going to point out is, see how his rack is here? Most guys, you wouldn't see it from the front, they're already hiding behind their body. So watch his left arm, track his left arm. It actually does come in towards and collapses to the ribs. So it, look at it. Ah, ooh. <laughs> ooh. But they didn't see that. They saw that, okay? So that's why it's a bit dangerous for people to look <coughs> It's not dangerous, like gonna hurt you, but I think a lot of uneducated uh, rec players can look at stuff online and maybe be copying the wrong things. So part of what I wanna teach you today is that I've actually had lessons where half of the lesson, this is a private lesson, I tell the parent, I go, hey, I'm." About 30 minutes, I'm going to have me and the child in the in my office, and we're going to be looking at things to make sure he understands. Then we're going to go back out. Also, we run academy days. Like this Saturday, I have a camp. It's going to go 4 to 9 p.m. There'll be 36 kids on six courts, and um, we we'll drove for two and a half hours, and then we have to play. So what I do is I take for about the last two hours, I take one group off the court while the other guy so we can thin down and play out points and then I have to do something with an off-court group uh, and then we we'll reverse it. Well guess what I'm doing with the off-court group usually? This kind of stuff, showing stuff. By the way, this is this footage is cracked for tennis pros for sure, um, but it, it'll hold the attention of a group of students for sure. Uh, if, I was, if you were all high schoolers and I'm showing you this and stopping and explaining, they actually like it quite a bit. Uh, so, that's, that's the Andy Murray front serve. Let's talk about his volleys. Uh, I'm going to show you a three volley sequence. You can already see, would, would some of you, <laughs> if you had a student take their forehand volley back that far, would you be fixing that? Some would, some won't. Uh, this is getting on the edge of where some, many pros would say, that's a little bit too far back. Don't take it back so far. So um, watch him, and watch at his point of contact, how his rack is wobbly. Uh, this, and his, I think his front game has improved a lot. So just watch here. Watch your racket wobble. Pushes forward, look where he finishes. Here comes number two. Watch his reverse here, that. I'll, I'll bring that back up in a minute. Look at that volley. Not judging, I just want you to look. Here's the third volley. All right, so for this one, let's open it up. Any comments? What's good? What'd you notice? I didn't realize that happened, or I knew that happened, or I didn't like this part, but I think this is good. Any, uh, it looked like on the second one that his point of contact was almost at his midpoint when he turned profile. Like okay. his, his point of contact was like right at his belly button, right there, which I would say is a little late. Yeah, usually, but it's yeah, yeah, yeah. usually I'm, in, I'm encouraging students to be catching the ball more out in front of their body and not wait for it to come back that far. I don't know the yeah. reference of the shot though. That might have all. They might have been right at his body. That might have been all yeah. he was done. He was, he was jammed a little bit. Yeah, it looked yeah. like he was. That one he wasn't jammed. Yeah. 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 It's interesting, all three are miss hits. Two of the first two were low on the racket, and I think the last one was high on the racket. That's kind of interesting that. Yeah. that um, um, crap. Um, I think what happens with volleys, more, more so than you think, at the point of contact, it's rarely clean. And oddly enough, there's always this little deflection of the racket, a lot more than I would think. I haven't looked at that close at my own. Probably perfect, no, it's probably. Um, <laughs> 
probably has the same issues. One thing that, as I pointed out in this video to one of my players, is he just hit this volley, right? So here's what I think. When it comes to volleys, here's my quick sales pitch. I'm talking to my students. All right, guys, you need to do three things. We're going to be a good volleyer. you got to be able to do three things, okay? Here they are. you got to take the ball that's coming and be able to add power to it. So let's say it's coming 70 miles an hour. You need to be able to add power. That's one skill. The other skill you need to be able to have is to match. So it brings 70, you just redirect at 70, you're matching it. And then the other skill is you need to decrease. So if it comes 70, you have to have the ability to hit at 30. You gotta be able to do all three if you wanna be a good mature volleyer, okay? We talk a lot about the, the four strikes on the shoulders, torso, knees, and below, uh, and what you can do on each of those. One thing that I like to teach, I literally think that it, that it's like patty cake. Like, could you stand up for a second? I will take new players and say, remember patty cake? And we clap, and then we go here, right? And then we clap, and we go here, clap, here, clap, here. I teach that as volleys. The clap if you're ready, and then you go forward. Now, patty cake, is there a backswing to patty cake? Do people go patty cake? <laughs> no, they don't. It's just here and forward. And I see some of the better players, Federer, actually the first move is not here, like what we're seeing with Murray. It's actually out, believe it or not. The first move is a bit of separation. The hands go forward like a cop stopping traffic. Hey, stop. Now, I can see Federer back here on some volleys, which I can show you. Or I can see him right here. I would say more of the, the better ones are keeping it more in front. Uh, but they volley from everything, and I think what happens is it's a little bit bigger than we think. I would have, before I started looking at all this, I would have said, well, the best pros on that swing size are probably a 1-1. One, one. And if they're taking power off, it might be a 1-0. If they're adding power, it might be a 1-2. But that is right there. And I'm seeing it, it's rarely a 1 backswing. Uh, yes? I was going to say, um, I teach you, like, I don't know, there is to be discussion, but it's just a catch. Okay, yeah. Not, balls are catching, you know, the way you catch a ball, you want to forward. And that way, when you're moving to the ball, the way it goes to the volley. And that's why when I, like, I was like, Andy Murray, when he makes contact, you want him to stop it. It's, it stops from his body. He's actually catching more front. And yeah. you move forward, and the way it goes with him. Yeah, so if you didn't hear what he said, the, ca the idea of catch, is a volley's a catch, right? Um, I have a video that where I put a can in here, I stuck a tennis can in here, it's empty, and now I have this little catching device. And I think that, so a glove, I, I use a glove, because I get the kid just understanding that, hey, well, actually, if you watch, the, and I actually coaches eye the kid catching a ball, so you can see what slow motion, what he really does is this. It goes back a bit, and you anticipate that. Um, and I said, on the volley, you, you know, you don't, take your baseball glove and go <laughs> and hit the ball that's coming, you kind of absorb it. Uh, but putting it here is even more specific and it's a little bit challenging. So um, I just wanted you to see three of his things. I want to keep going because we're going to run out of time. Uh, just one thing I know that. Backhand return this is. Anything weird about this? It's a little bit bigger backswing than I expected yeah, on a ball coming up fast at you. Okay. A little bit bigger backswing. Now, this was a second serve, not a first. I can tell you that much. Um, see, we watch, watch that area. This wristband and this wrist. Watch it closely. I think, to me, it looks like he's here and then he's. <coughs> Is there not a hump appearing yeah. there that wasn't there before? Um, and I didn't think that he did that, to be honest with you. So watch for a hump here. A little more broken than I thought. So other people are changing the grip more? Well, what I couldn't figure out is if he's, <coughs> I think the really good players have the ability to, kind of like how you can get on the outer edge of the forehand stuff. I think he can do that. I think he probably would do both. If I did 10 of these, we might see a hump once in a while and not on some others. And if he's behind, I think that hump would go away and it'd be more dominant on the left hand. 
But I did notice that, and, I, and also look at his finish. He literally hit his back. And if I remember filming this, is that I remember a hearing hit his back. And I thought that was strange. So that, you know, you can see he wasn't 100% running. This is like a warm up return. So um, I just thought that was interesting. If we go next, here's his forehand, right? He has less of a hammer grip, I'm sorry, less of a, of a trigger grip and more of a hammer grip than I realized. I thought for sure I would have paid money. Show me his grip, I would have said it's like this. Not this way, but this, 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 or this, okay? I call this hammer, I call this trigger. Okay, so right now it looks like a, a, a bit of a trigger, right? Watch this closely. What happened to that trigger? Hmm. At the moment, I wouldn't say that's trigger. I, I would probably try to fix someone. And by the way, this is my BS. <laughs> when you are a trigger grip, it lines up your knuckle and you pad the hand, USBK test, on both <laughs> the same level. When you don't, let's say it's Eastern forehand, right? There's my Eastern forehand, also on level three. But if you don't have the, the if it goes to a hammer, that stays a three, but that can't stay on three. It goes up to two. And, and right now, I can tell because I have eyes. That's that's not. I don't know what that grip is. It comes back a teeny bit, but look at it. Watch this finish, by the way. Even right there. Let's go back a couple frames. That finger, I usually have it way higher up. Watch this finish. He got permission from, oh, I thought that was the wrong thing. <laughs> um, pretty flexible, right? The, the, that's the full. So, so, I show you that because I will show this. So we do a lot of in-house training with my own staff. And if you follow my Facebook, you saw that last week I, I was losing a pro at my club. That makes two pros that lasted in the last three weeks, or last three months. Uh, because I'm a tyrant, <laughs> uh, they all have really, I love them, they're doing great. But um, luckily I have this really good onboarding system and we'll be covering a lot of this with our place. But the point is, range of acceptability. I, I'm pushing pros to think about, don't be so hard line and don't go crazy, you know. I wouldn't ever say, that a continental forehand, could it be hit? Yeah, Persephone was pretty good back in you know, Whale Health back here. Um, but I, that's outside the range of acceptability, okay? To me, full on Western is outside the range of acceptability. I wouldn't teach that to anybody. But I would admit, I've had people come to me that have this, have you ever tried to change someone from a full Western to not a full Western? It isn't not outpatient surgery, it is a freaking <laughs> big operation. Uh, they don't just go, oh yeah, that feels a lot better. They go just one notch over and it's in the screen and they're like, ah. <laughs> So sometimes it's not worth it. If you're a senior in high school, which this, I had this conversation last summer, the girl says, you know, everybody's telling me I have too much spin and I can't penetrate through the court and it, it's fluffy and I can't hurt somebody. I go, ah, that's pretty accurate. Uh, well, I want to try to, I want to try to maybe change my grip to change that. Uh, and we, within five minutes, I said, we're, I, I highly recommend that you don't do this because your tryouts are in one, mo in one month. And then she was a senior, and I knew she wasn't gonna play high school or college tennis. Um, so, so that would have been, I think, no practice. But um, <laughs> I've done that. Okay, just for fun, I put these two cats um, side by side, just so you can see how the, the, I, linked, I synced it up to the point of contact. Um, I am, we got to get clipped in here, so. Oh. See a, a much more space here than here? Watch Novak's right arm get kind of cranky. It's bent, it's bent. And is his wrist not doing <coughs> this? Right here, is his wrist kind yeah, of Yeah, it's sort of. A little interesting, right? They both are releasing about the same height. So this is 
you know, strings down, palm down. This is palm backwards. <laughs> like the item. Um, he is uh, about to wave off the part of me. I'm not sure. look more similar. The point of contacts are what's matched up here. You can see in a second here that as they go up you can see strings. You can see the W, you can see the head thing there. Bleeding with the elbow, bleeding with the elbow. There's the point of contact for both of them. Just watch their inverted elbows. Inverted elbow on Novak right here is very evident almost every serve. I like to use him because if you, if you do that, that gets your, it's not wrist snap, it takes care of everything going ever how it's here, here, and here. Uh, that's the look I try to get my players to do. Um, but similar, but a few changes, a few differences. I have a question. Um, yeah. The biggest thing I know between both servers is that is the toss. No yeah. guy toss the ball further in front, mm -hmm. the etc. is behind. What do you, what kind of style do you teach me? Uh, <coughs> so I, first of all, let me say that when, when you film these pros, um, first of all, I, I had two cameras. I rented two of those big cameras. And my other cameraman was my guy, Kenny. Kenny's my editor. He works full time at Campus Sandy Inc. kind of thing. Um, Kenny is not a tennis person. So a couple years ago, we'd go and we would get the court, you know, media pass, you get to know where we're going to, of course, it's going to be set up. And then when you set up your camera, all the people here love you. You know, are hey, you going to stand there? Yeah, I'm sorry. Man. <laughs> and they get all pissed off at you. And the other problem I had is Kenny doesn't know who Roger Federer is from Roger Federer Luke. Okay, so Kenny, uh, half the time, I'm filming Federer and he's filming. He's supposed to be filming Federer from multiple angles. And he's filming like Joe Smith from Ohio State University. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> you know, that happened like three times. It was just kind of funny. But the other thing is, when they come out, they have one hour practice sessions. And they all get to maximum effort within different times. So there was footage. That, frankly, the first 15 minutes, I didn't even turn on the camera because they're doing this. The hidden serves like this, and, and they're, it's not any, with any intensity. So I think some of it is that. Um, I prefer, I think if on the best serves, it, it depends. If it's a first serve or an aggressive serve, that should definitely, if it would have bounced, it should have been inside the court. Uh, if it's going to be a kick serve or a side spin serve, it's closer to the line a little bit behind. Um, and I think that's what you see with the pros. The pros are a little better than right players at being able to do different serve types off of one ball toss. <coughs> um, whereas the right players have to kind of do it, you know, like when they kick serve, sometimes it's obvious with their toss. All right, Serena, pretty good server. She hits all the classic, you know, checkpoints. Um, we all know that Serena's technical parameters probably are what some people. Yeah, Coach Craig. Um, just wonder if you're seeing any evolution in serving technique. If you watch, I assume, hundreds of hours of videos. Yeah. What's it going to look like in seven, eight years? Um, or things that have changed in the last five to seven years? Well, the, the big thing I think has changed is the amount of people using abbreviated backswing. Um, that's gone through the roof. Uh, and even as a coach, you know, Federer is still very traditional. It's very much, you know, I was taught literally down together, up together. And my coach would want my arms like this. I remember him saying, palm down, palm up. You know, do that. 
and these start as like that. Okay. Well, now it's really more like that uh, with this delay. But the number one thing I see for sure is, you know, back in the day, I remember, don't tell anybody, um, because the way I was taught, I had a kid way back in the 80s that kind of had like an abbreviated serve, and I, I fixed it. I said, don't do that. And here's why you don't want to do it. I'm going to blow you in <laughs> Why on earth would you go backwards? This is your backswing, right? It shouldn't go forward. It should go backwards. Besides, if you go forward, you're going to have to eventually stop before you come backwards. And that's how stupid it was. Because now, you don't really have to stop. You just kind of keep it going. Um, but that's the number one big thing I see, Coach. Um, and honestly, I've been trying that with some of our rec players, just to take them to the, uh, the abbreviated backswing serve. And about 50% of the time, they do that better. Um, but yeah, that's probably the number one thing. Yes? Don't you, don't you find that to be a rhythm-related thing? Like, so a lot of the rec players, I think the backswing, they need it if they are more rhythm. Yeah, I do think there's a more. shorter backswing works for that non-rhythm type of. Yeah, I would say that's true. There's there's more of fluidity and more of a thing when it works full. Yeah. Mark Kovac talked about that a couple of years ago. Yeah. Erotic serves like that. Yeah, erotic. And then he went into it, there was less stress on the shoulder. And that was okay. killing my shoulder, just doing the traditional. Okay. And I changed it back to here, and I don't have any more shoulder problems. So if you didn't hear what she said, uh, is that Coach Mark Mo, uh, Kovacs was saying that he's actually studied that and that people would do the abbreviated backswing have less torque, and you found that to be true yourself. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're clocking triple digits now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to go quick. I just want to show you something. Would you teach this technique? Straight back. Would you teach that? Crap. <laughs> There's no circular, right? It just kind of went straight back here. And it's there early to the point where she has to now wait. It's waiting, it's waiting, it's waiting. The ball's moving a lot. Of, and now it goes up, yeah. and then it comes down kind of like a schwink. So that's pretty sweet right there, that. Bam, she also <laughs> has an incredible finish. Um, range of acceptability, right? Uh, I would not want to teach my players to prepare so early <coughs> that they have to wait. I'd rather get that smoothed out so it's a continuous thing. But I think she's does pretty good with it. I think. In her case, it's because she's a freakishly good athlete. Uh, here's the next video of her hitting. Look at how, and by the way, her dad, Richard, taught her this, and, she, and he's proud of it. Uh, get it back early. Watch. She's going to take her racket early. Let's count how many steps she'll take. Okay, back. Just back. One step. Two steps. Still back. Three steps. Another, and then crank. Who thinks you should have it back that early? Who thinks it should be? She should have run more traditionally than got it back on the third set. I'm not here to tell you. I'm just looking at stuff. Um, we're gonna run out of time, guys. So I'm gonna sh just show you one or two more. Uh, Halop on the serve. I'm gonna pause it in a position that I. Here's a semi-abbreviated. Doesn't go back too far. Okay, who thinks, crap, uh, who likes uh, this position? Yeah. Weird. Yeah, it's it very, it's a little, it's like a touchdown, right? But, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, now watch, to be fair, most of you are saying this arm should be down more, you know, should be, but watch what happens to that arm. Does it come down, does it come down here? So that doesn't look so bad, right? Yeah. But a few frames ago, it looked kind of funky. Here's your forehand. Um, okay. Rack ahead way above her head. Dancing out of the way. At one, but I love about this picture right here. 45 degree turn, 90 degree turn of the hips, and more. You can see just the obvious, you know, Coiling of the and uncoiling of the kinetic link. Uh, there's a point of contact, and then extension like crazy to the finish. 
The next one with her, she moves, that's a different type of forehand. And she's just gonna step up and attack this forehand, it's a little bit short. Still up above the head. But watch what I love is that she doesn't go left foot to left foot, but she keeps her right, it's actually left foot to right foot there, but she keeps going forward. I think we need to teach that shot. Um, this is just her doing both. Uh, volleys, no, because we have to watch the man's backhand, right? I mean, that's what you all came for. Look real closely and tell me if you think his first reaction is to push the, the racket away from his chest a bit. Okay, see this? I call that, I ride a motorcycle, right? So I call that giving it the gas. There's, a, there's not a valley in the hump, it's not flush, it's like a huge, you know, I think cranking of the wrist that way. That's an official USPTA term, cranking. cranking. <laughs> um, and then watch him commit to this and look at his finish. Yes. <laughs> Here's what I want to show you. Uh, Dimitrov serve, very classic. Um, I don't want to show you him actually. Uh, this is what I want to show you. Right, I'm over. Yeah. Okay, see the wrist? Similar, right? Similar position. A lot of one-handers don't do that. They're heat. they're flush, and that is the beginning of problem. But also, you're going to see why you don't want to copy the pros. Because as you know, he's a freakish athlete. He does yoga and stuff. Right. So right there, my pack fell off. <laughs> but just for fun, we're going to look at this one because this is him. He is, is, what happened is the sun went under a cloud here. That's why it's darker. This will be the last one to look at. Been pretty classic. Look at this finish, man. But even better, this one he runs right at the camera this next backhand he's like five feet away from me and then I want you to check out this finish which Federer gets in this position sometimes as well on the finish the shoulder blades are touching alright so if I would have said this is how they finish <laughs> when I saw that I was like holy yeah. Now I don't, this is, I would never teach that. I don't think anybody could do that in this room probably. But you know, earlier that morning he was out there doing yoga and this guy is like bending him all over and like stuff. So uh, he has some skills there that most people don't. So here's the takeaways. Think about range of acceptability. Um, right player should not always uh, replicate the pros. And all of this footage is free if you want to look at it. It's on my website, JorgeCapistani.com. Most of you know about the drills website, but this it doesn't reside there. Uh, this footage, and it's free. You can send this to your uh, students. You can 